Today we're going to build the Electrodocus solar battery management system with the lithium iron phosphate 8S configuration battery. And before we build it, I want to talk about how this is different than other battery management systems on the market. Typically with a BMS system, you will use a large bank of parallel FETs as an on and off switch for high and low voltage disconnect, and you'll have individual cell monitoring to control that. With this, this has individual cell monitoring and management but it uses communication wires instead to turn on and off the inverter or the solar charge controller. Now let's actually build it. Step number one of the manual says to connect the main unit to the cells with this balance cable. And in the manual, it shows a complete system overview with circuit breakers, shunts, the balance leads, and everything else you need to know. I want you guys to look over this first and then scroll down to step one and you will see the cell configurations and we have an 8S, so we're gonna choose this one. And you will notice that there will be a 10, 11, 12 lead going to a single positive or the main positive and one and two going to the main negative. So when you have this cable, you need to think about that and you cannot reverse these wires. And these are very small wires for being a balance cable. I kind of wish they were bigger. And technically they're the right gauge because they're voltage sensing wires and they only need to balance or manage the pack. So it's fine, but I kind of wish they were bigger for my terminal connectors that I'm using. So number 12 wire is the one marked with red and that's gonna be the main positive. So we need to take the three first wires and connect this to main positive. For balance leads, I'm now using the Wi-Fi heat shrink ring connector for 3 eighths an inch for this terminal because these are pretty big and these are very small wires. So you have to get the specialty ones. And these crimpers are really good for small connections. I love them. Now that we have the main positive done, the main negative is the first and the second wire on the balance lead. So again, read the manual. You do not want to screw this up. It could burn it out and destroy it. So we have the main positive, the main negative, and all of the balance leads are connected. Before we connect this balance lead to this system, we are gonna check it one last time. All right, I think we're good to go. Let's plug it in. I hate these moments because you never know if something's gonna blow up. Look at that, guys, it turned on. How cool is that? And this is the first menu you will see. Monitoring, parameter settings, device settings, automation for controlling solar charge controllers or inverters, diagnostics, manual, and install, and about. So let's go to the monitoring section first. And this is the monitoring section. We have 25 volts for the whole pack, and these are the cell voltages. I just realized that the terminals were not tightened down, so now the cell voltages are like rock solid. So that was my mistake. Now look at these voltages, they are rock solid. Okay, let's go to parameter settings. Oh, they have lithium titanate, LCO, lithium iron phosphate. So let's set that. The battery capacity is 100 and then set that and store parameters. Oh, you just click it. Oh, cool, it did it. Over voltage, we could set that to 3.6, but 3.5 is okay. Under voltage is at 2.8, which is totally good as well. These are very conservative figures that he chose, which are actually smart, especially for a solar power system in long-term use. These settings are actually really good. I'm just gonna leave them. You can change every setting on this. This is great, guys. This is, he did a good job here. You can also add your own temperature sensor if you want as well. Now the settings are changed, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna see what the device settings is all about. So time and date, LCD and touch key, Wi-Fi, USR, internal data log. So lots of cool data logging that you can do, which I need to connect to Wi-Fi and do that sometime, but I don't have that module yet. So we're gonna have to do that in another video. And under diagnostics, it tells you what every single port is doing. And then I tried to press the manual and install button, but it wouldn't do anything in the about. Let's see. Oh, it tells you how many watt hours your PV array has generated, the hardware, software, the MPPT, how many watt hours if you're using the Victron, all sorts of other cool stuff. He did a great job, man. This is so cool. So the monitor does work, but I have to wait for the shunt to come in the mail. So fast forward a whole week later and we have two shunts and this will connect to our battery and the SBMS and it will tell us how much current is going in or out of the battery and it will compute the state of charge. And I have a new hydraulic crimper. I like these, but the last one I had broke, but this one has good reviews, so I'm hoping it will work well. 
Look at that. Hydraulic crimpers have like the best looking crimps around. That is beautiful. Because the max current I expect from this battery bank is 200 amps, I'm using a 300 amp shunt. The manual also talks about how much resistance and heat is given off by these and how you should rate them. And typically it's gonna be 66% of the load. The next step is connecting the SBMS to these two shunts. And you have two screw terminals on the top and these measure the voltage drop across each shunt. And he recommends using a CAT6 cable. So I need to go to the store again and go get a cable. So I'll be right back. Now we have a CAT6 cable and we need to connect it to these little terminals on the side of the unit. And each one will go to a corresponding shunt terminal. And I only bought this for $3 at Walmart, so you're just gonna snip it off and then strip it with one of these. And inside the cable, you will have pairs of wires. So two of these can go to the discharge shunt and two of these can go to the charge shunt. And these are very small wires, so use this type of stripper. And all you have to do is push these wires after they are stripped into the corresponding hole, but you cannot pull them out once they are attached. If you wanna pull them out, you need to take a small piece of metal like these tweezers and insert it in the tiny rectangle above the wire. If you push it in, then you can release the wire. But if you try to pull it, it can damage it. So be very careful. Now we have the wires connected to the shunt so we can connect the SBMS to power and see if it turns on. And now it's turned on, but we need to change the settings for the resistance value of this shunt so it can actually compute the proper current. And this shunt is not accurate. It says 0.014, and that's like self-consumption rate of this thing, but it's not showing me the consumption of the load, so it's not working. Yeah, load is still at zero amps. I'm gonna email him. I don't understand what's not working here. So I just got an email back, and I'm supposed to put it on the positive side of the battery. See, even I did not listen. I did not read the manual properly. I always put shunts on the negative. So let's switch it over and see what happens. And before you connect power to the unit, you wanna make sure there's zero current so that it can calibrate itself. So let's add power. Okay, it's finally working, you guys. Perfect. Wow, I am such an idiot. And at the top, we have 284 watts that we're pulling from the battery. You should ignore the PV, though, because I haven't set up that shunt yet. I have only calibrated and set up the battery shunt. So let's remove the load and add a charger. And now we're charging with 10 amps, but it shows 17 amps on the screen. So again, read the manual, do the math, change the settings for your shunt value. And this is the shunt menu, so it's EXTADC. And the battery shunt value, I have a 300 amp shunt, and it's a 75 millivolt. If you divide those two numbers, you get 0.25 milliohms. So I set that number, and now the results should be accurate. And look at that, we've got 10.4 amps. And we have 10.5 amps up here. So it's actually showing accurate results. That's perfect. And if you round this number up, it actually will give you this number. And because of the decimal mark on this one, these are exact. So what we wanna do now is cycle it so that we can give it a state of charge reading. Cause right now the numbers are all over the place, but typically if you charge it up and then discharge it all the way down, it will actually reset itself. So let's do that real quick. Now the battery is fully charged and we're at 100% on here. So it reset it once it hit a high state of charge and the current is finally dropping. We're at 3.5 to 3.6 volts per cell. So now we're gonna discharge the battery and see what happens. Now we're pulling 61 amps and you can see the state of charge is already starting to decrease. So let's come back in a few minutes and see what happens. In the last few clips, we were experimenting with the SBMS with an inverter, but the inverter that I had connected does not have a remote control relay input. So that means that I cannot use this to control that inverter. And if I were to run it to zero, it could damage these battery cells. And all of the inverters on the market that actually have the remote control input, such as the Victron, are extremely expensive. For like a 1200 watt inverter, it's $404. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take an LV2424 by MPP, and it has a switch on the side for the inverter to be on or off. So we're gonna take one of the outputs or the re relay controls that you would use on a Victron inverter and we're gonna turn this inverter on or off. And this is the inside of an LV2424 and over here is a switch that turns the inverter on or off. 
Now we have two leads connected to the switch. We're gonna connect this to the SBMS. The manual states that the remote inverter control wires need to be connected to EXT I03. We have one right here and one right here. So now we have the inverter connected to some jumper cables and we're gonna give it some power. And to ensure that the inverter control settings are correct, go into this EXTIOX menu. And if you put the top one to zero and you have EXT3 connected to the inverter, it should turn off. And now let's change this to two so we use it as a low voltage disconnect. So if you change it to two, and it turns on like my inverter just did, that means that everything's working properly. If it did not do that, that means that the polarity is reversed on these two wires that go out to the inverter. So let's add a load and see what happens. It actually works, you guys. Oh my gosh. It hit 2.8 volts and it disconnected the inverter. Now we're gonna plug the charger into the wall and see if the state of charge indicator resets and goes up to 100%. And then we will know that it's actually calibrated correctly by doing a full cycle. So let's do that real quick. And this battery charger is nuts. It can pull 60 amps at 24 volts or 1500 watts pretty much. So we're gonna see how much we can get. Right now where it's charging at 37 amps. And it is continuing to rise. That is so crazy. Oh, and now the inverter just turned on. So the reconnect voltage to turn the inverter on just switched on. So it should turn it on indefinitely. Guys, check it out. We're pulling 59 amps into this battery. Somebody wanted me to verify this. So there you go. This thing can pull 60 amps practically. That's incredible. And the state of charge indicator is actually reset. So that's working. And now we're at 2% state of charge and the inverter is also on. So everything works. This is an actual system that we could use if we connected solar to the uh, MPP. Now the battery is fully charged, but it's exceeding the rated capacity because these are new cells. So what you would want to do is when it starts hitting 3.6 volts for one of the cells, change the absorption or the charging limit voltage of your solar charge controller to whatever voltage this is right now. Also, I disconnected the inverter unless it would stay on the whole time and the standby consumption for MPPs is pretty high. So if you want to control the inverter remotely, just put a switch on one of these leads that controls the inverter. So if you're in a living room and you want to flip a switch and turn on the inverter, you do it through one of these conductors. Something else that I haven't gone into is the data logging of this system. There is all sorts of amazing things that you can track and log. You can also download a whole month of data and you can download it onto your computer or you could get the Wi-Fi dongle. Personally, I never like to do data logging unless it's a large array or it's a complex system. For small systems such as these, I just wanna know if it's actually functioning well and how much energy I created for that single day. And data logging is very useful for diagnostics or if you have a very large system to see how the cells are working over time. But for small systems like this, I don't care at all. I just want to check and make sure it's working and then I don't want to touch it. If I have to check it all the time, that means that it's a badly designed system. And for this system, I would set up the settings, cycle it for a couple of months, and then come back and see what the trends are every day. But as long as it stays fully charged, I could care less. Something else I forgot to talk about is that the SBMS, you can also buy these switching regulators or pulse width modulation solar charge controllers. And these work very well if you match the solar panel to your battery bank's nominal voltage. And when you match a panel to a battery bank, you can actually use a pulse width modulation controller with high efficiency and lots of power availability. So typically a solar panel works at a very specific voltage for the maximum current, and that's the power point. Typically we use an MPPT to track the power point and to use it. But if you know how to match your solar panel to the battery bank, you will actually have a lot of usable power and these last for a very long time. Compared to an MPPT, these will last way longer and these are very cheap. So this is always a good option. But what I don't like about these is that you cannot put all of your panels into series. 
So that means you're gonna use a lower voltage. That means that you need to carry higher current. So if you are going to use these or a pulse width modulation controller of your choice, you need to use a very thick gauge wire to carry all of that current. And in this kit, he gave me three of these. Right now it's winter and it's actually raining outside or else I would actually test this. What's cool about the SBMS is if you think about how everything's controlled, um, there's nothing that will burn out soon. There's no electrolytic capacitors. There's no FETs to burn out for the switching. I think that's the biggest benefit of this system is the longevity. This is made to be used for a very long time with high quality components. Over a FET-based BMS, this is keen. But you have to think before you build it. You know, you have to match your components together and give it some thought. So I'm glad that I actually made this inverter work because I was gonna have to buy a Victron. And those things were so expensive. I was like, come on, man. For an inverter, it's like two or three times the cost of my other inverters. Now I wanna hear what you guys think. Am I missing a potential application here? Is there some feature that I missed? Please let me know in the comments section below. I just wanted to give a general overview, but if you guys give me a fun idea of what to build with this, we can do it. We can throw these in the solar shed, add a solar panel, and do some really cool testing. But so far it just works and I like it and that's it. So yeah, let me know and thank you so much for watching and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.